We're hearing from a top NFL agent about how the league is changing and what it means for players. Plus, we have new details on Tyreek Hill's detainment, ESPN's AI system is off to a rocky start, and the PWHL picked team names. It's Tuesday, September 10th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, I speak with Wasserman's top football agent, Doug Hendrickson, on the changing nature of NFL contracts and why deals for star players are getting shorter. I also learned the origin story of his podcast with Gavin Newsom and Marshawn Lynch. Our reporter, AJ Perez, joins to give the latest on Tyreek Hill, and I chat with reporter Margaret Fleming on how the PWHL picked team names. The Professional Women's Hockey League revealed new team names and logos for each of its six inaugural teams. What was once PWHL Boston, PWHL Ottawa, etc., is now the Boston Fleet, Ottawa Charge, Minnesota Frost, Montreal Victoire, New York Sirens, and Toronto Scepters. Each team will go by its name, starting with the PWHL second season, which begins in early December. As the blackout of Disney channels on DirecTV heads into a second straight week, DirecTV has filed a complaint with the FCC, alleging that Disney has failed to negotiate in good faith. A spokesperson from DirecTV said that Disney has violated the FCC's good faith mandates, quote, by predicating any licensing agreement on DirecTV's waiving any legal claims on Disney's past, current, or future anti-competitive actions. Until the feud between the two media companies ends, DirecTV users will be without ESPN, ABC, FX, ACC Network, SEC Network, and other Disney channels. The U.S. Open announced that it served over 1 million in-person spectators for the tournament, its first time ever eclipsing that mark and good for an 8% increase from 2023. The Open largely attributes the increase in attendance to the new FanFest event that took place over this past weekend. You also have to imagine that having two U.S. players in both the men's and women's semifinals and one each in the finals played a role too. With just three weeks until the MLB playoffs, ESPN is introducing a new whip around style TV show highlighting games in the division and wildcard races that will set the stage for the postseason. The show, titled Baseball Tonight Special MLB Squeeze Play, debuts tonight at 7 p.m. and will continue every Wednesday night until the playoffs begin. After his detainment on the way to the Miami Dolphins season opener, Tyreek Hill has said that he is still trying to process the event. In a press conference after the game, Hill said, I still don't know what happened, but I do want to use this platform to say, what if I wasn't Tyreek Hill? Worst case scenario, you know? Hill is pulled over on the way to Hard Rock Stadium after allegedly driving dangerously. The Miami Police Union stated that Hill was uncooperative and was, quote, redirected to the ground only after refusing to sit. My colleague AJ Perez spoke to Hill's agent Drew Rosenhaus about this saga, and we break that down next. Joined now by Front Office Sports Senior Reporter AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Thanks for having me back. Hey, great to have you on. So you're reporting that Tyreek Hill could take legal action against the Miami PD. Do we know what form that might take? It's still early. It's going to be up to his lawyers. I talked to his agent, uh, Drew Rosenhaus, briefly yesterday uh, over text. And, uh, and uh, yeah, there, that's one of the options. It's some kind of lawsuit, uh, you know, excessive force kind of, kind of uh, um, lawsuit against the Miami Dade police. Um, yeah, that's uh, after after what happened yesterday with the, his detainment before yesterday's game. How did all of this even start? Yeah, it was some kind of driving infraction. Uh, we don't have the, the precise, uh, you know, charge. It could have been reckless or something else. Uh, but it was pretty, you know, pretty evident that, uh, you know, there was at least one teammate that came to his aid. We saw several or a handful of videos of passersby uh, who actually caught him, you know, outside of his sports car. It looked like a Lamborghini. Um, on his stomach, on you know, proned out, and then him being put in handcuffs. No arrest was made. Uh, he was allowed to, you know, he was allowed out of his handcuffs, and uh, he went on to uh, help, uh, you know, the Dolphins come back uh, and beat the Jaguars yesterday. And he, obviously, we kind of highlighted in 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 our story his 80-yard touchdown pass. He had a uh, handcuff celebration at the end. Um, so he, but 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 after the game, he he was all you know, he was all business. He was all. He, he in his news conference he said you know basically he, he he's you know, he, he didn't do anything he didn't cuss the police he respects the police and uh, and you know that it, <laughs> he didn't say he didn't threaten uh, you know any 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 action but already um, the the police uh, for you know have already uh, gave one officer um, what amounts to desk duty after um, the director of the uh, PD reviewed some of the body cam footage. So, yeah, one of the officers involved, I guess, has, um, you know, gotten some kind of treatment, not not let go or anything. But 
Um, you know, there's been some response already. Anything else we know about what they're doing here? At least their body cams were on. Uh, we didn't have that with Scotty Scheffler. Uh, three of the officers, including the one that was allegedly dragged uh, by uh, by Scheffler's SUV, none of them had their body cams on at the time of the incident. It looks like we have at least one, if not multiple, body cam feeds to review. And uh, we're, we're going to see you know, what, uh, and it'll be released to the public at some point. And then we will see what actually happened, the, the interaction, what uh, Tyreek Dill allegedly did uh, that caused him to be stopped and then pulled out of his car. And uh, what any consequences, um, if any, these officers face besides that one, as you mentioned, who's on administrative duties uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, these investigations can take a, take a while. And um, according to Drew Rosenhaus' agent, uh, Tyree Hill has already been reached out by the Internal Affairs Division of the Miami Dade Police Department. Have we gotten any hints or, or just, I guess, any speculation around anything the team or the even the NFL might do as part of the situation? They usually just uh, kind of wait back at this point. There's really no major allegations against Tyree Kill, which is their, you know, t- uh, top concern of these things. Uh, the whole conduct detrimental could lead to a suspension if anything was found. Uh, he's been uh, at least once before in his career that he's kind of found himself into uh, in in that situation. This is, goes back to a long time ago. This back when he was in basically college and uh, college days. So you know, there's. Uh, there's a lot to, you know, there's a lot to go through at this point. There could be several witnesses, obviously, if you have uh, several different um, uh, uh, camera, you know, phone, phone cameras going and, you know, re- and taking pictures and recording what happened. So there, that'll also be part of the investigation. They may be asking for any uh, any more public uh, public help when it comes to uh, video or, 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 or photos or other eyewitness footage. These investigations usually take a while, but they've already responded so quickly. You know, when you have a, especially with a black player, um, and uh, we we had uh, one quarterback, uh, as we saw, kind of re- ended his career. You know, him calling him calling attention out to this. So I think this is something that the um, the authorities down in Miami are going to take seriously, and uh, we'll probably get all the facts within the next uh, many days, and we could actually get the full picture of what actually happened. Yeah. Should be interesting to watch. AJ Perez, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Meanwhile, Hill's quarterback, Tua Tagovailoa, voiced his support, but left some wiggle room in case any troubling details come out. Yeah, I, I found out from a couple guys. I didn't know that it happened and then went up to ask Tyreek. Tyreek told me his story. Now, I'm always going to support my teammate. You know, I'm, I'm always going to support my teammate. From what he told me, I only know that side of the story. I don't know the other side, but I'm always going to support him. Um, going to have his back, and you know, I, it was just an unfortunate deal that happened today. Dak Prescott said he's focused on, quote, holding up my end of the deal, and I'm sure the Cowboys are happy to hear that after they gave him the highest average annual salary of any player ever at $60 million per season. Of course, big deals for quarterbacks don't always pan out, and we saw that on display on Sunday. The Giants inked quarterback Daniel Jones to a four-year, $160 million deal heading into the 2023 season. Since then, he has played seven games and thrown eight interceptions against two touchdowns. In fact, Jones has thrown more touchdowns to opposing teams than his own. His salary is only fully guaranteed through this year. That's not the case for Deshaun Watson, whose entire $230 million deal is guaranteed. That's not great for Browns fans who just watched him go 23 for 45 against the Cowboys, but hey, they only gave up six picks to get him, including three first rounders. Meanwhile, Hassan Reddick is still looking for a deal to live up to. After sitting out the Jets' Monday night game against the 49ers, Reddick has forfeited around $6 million in fines related to his holdout. His contract pays him $15 million this year. He loses $800,000 for every game he misses. Over to someone who did hold up her end of the deal. Alex Morgan's final moment as a professional soccer player was poetic and emotional. She took off her cleats at midfield and waved to the cheering crowd as they took in the historic moment. It's a moment that the NWSL fully leaned into with every media partner broadcasting the game. One of those was ESPN2. Another way that ESPN covered the game was through an AI-generated recap, which they are just starting to roll out. And in doing so, they did a great service to all of us writers by showing how AI can miss the point sometimes. The recap did not mention Morgan at all until it was edited later after being publicly publicly called out. Morgan is one of the most impactful players in soccer history in how she popularized the women's game, fought for equal pay, and invested in women's sports media. Her impact will be felt for a generation or more. But to ESPN's AI system, the real story of the game was the performance of North Carolina's Malia Berkeley, who had three assists. 
Former President Donald Trump took a moment in his busy schedule to weigh in on one of the most anticipated features of this NFL season, the new kickoff rule. The Republican presidential nominee is not a fan. On his own social media platform, Truth Social, Trump wrote, I can't believe the NFL is effectively getting rid of the always exciting kickoff return. Such an exciting part of football. What are they doing? Beginning of the end. Presidential candidates probably don't have a lot of time for the nuances of new NFL rules, and it's safe to say that the former president is missing the point here. The entire motivation behind the new kickoff rule is, of course, to bring back the excitement in this part of the game, and week one delivered. Cardinals returner DJ Dallas raced past every Buffalo Bill on Sunday en route to a 96-yard return touchdown. There are only four kickoff return touchdowns in all of last year. The new kickoff is going to look weird for a few weeks, but it is a lot more fun. Speaking of politics... As politicians in Washington discuss banning TikTok, the hockey team is going in the opposite direction. The Washington Capitals made the short-form video platform its road jersey sponsor and the presenting partner of its 50th anniversary celebration. The deal is between TikTok and Monumental Sports and Entertainment, which is the umbrella company for the Ted Leonsis Sports Empire. That means it will also include some programming with the Washington Wizards, Mystics, the G League's Capital City Go-Go, and the NBA 2K's Wizards District Gaming. Meanwhile, support for banning the platform has been steadily dropping among Americans since last year, according to Pew Research. Doug Hendrickson is a veteran NFL agent and has seen team philosophies and player desires shift over the years. We discussed why big contracts are getting shorter, what players want from their agencies that they didn't before, when it makes sense for a player to hold out, and how he ended up co-hosting a podcast with Marshawn Lynch and Gavin Newsom. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Doug Henderson, Executive Vice President of Wasserman Football. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. How are you, man? Hope you had a good weekend. Yeah, yeah, likewise. Yeah, how you been? Been good. Uh, football's back. Uh, what an exciting, uh, you know, Thursday night game, Friday night game, and then uh, Sunday game. So it's uh, it's thankfully back and a uh, great weekend to have it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you're the lead NFL agent at Wasserman, it's a huge agency. Uh, why don't you just start by giving us the quick version of how you ended up where you are? Well, long story, I've been doing this now for almost 30 years. Started kind of uh, on my own out of college uh, out of San Jose State in 1994 and uh, was on my own for about six, seven years. Went to Octagon for about 14 years. Short stint at Relativity and then joined up with Washman in 2017 with my partner, CJ LeBoy and a few others. And now we run football here. And, uh, you know, Washman is a global agency, uh, about 110 NFL clients. And uh, we have sports and every, every other sport other than tennis uh, and based in L.A. But it's a great company, great, uh, great group of people. And uh, we're rolling. So I want to talk about NFL contracts. I'm sort of curious how they've changed over the years. I want to start with guaranteed money. So my sense is that the stars, like the percent of guaranteed money that star players are getting has gone up over the years. I'm wondering, one, is that true? And two, is it true for everyone else? Because that I don't have as much of a sense of. It, it has gone up. I mean, it used to be bad. I mean, some teams certainly don't. Like there's, you know, like Seattle Seahawks and the Green Bay Packers, depending on the positions, don't do a lot of guaranteed money or even the Steelers. But for the most part, you're right. I mean, most, the percentage of guaranteed money has gone up for the top level players. I think you're seeing uh, the the 10% of the guys uh, making big money with big guarantees versus the past. Uh, but it's almost getting like basketball where you're having quarterbacks making 55. Now Dak Prescott, 60 million. You're having receivers make 35 million. Defensive ends make 35 million corners. So you're having six, seven, eight guys in a team making big money. And then you have a lot of the lower class, i.e. the rookies, uh, undrafted players, first year contracts. So you're having a kind of a skewed system now where the middle class has kind of gone away. You're having the high end guys, and kind of the lower end guys, but the guaranteed money is increasing for the top end guys, which is obviously a great thing for us as agents. Yeah, but how about that that middle the middle class, you know, of NFL players? What does that mean for you that you know they are? You know, it's harder to I imagine harder to find a deal for them because they want to be treated, well, but um, if they're not a star and they're not cheap, you're kind of stuck, right? Well, hundred percent. And also, it's like look at the team, look at the teams that are that are, I mean, the, the team needs that are out there. I mean, for example, like inside linebackers kind of gone down, down running backs. And so those guys are certainly harder to find jobs for the right money, but you're right. I mean, the guys that are uh, the middle of the road guys that are trying to get, uh, you know, let's say eight, $9 million a year, which is middle-class now, they might, teams might say, listen, we could go find a rookie, draft a rookie in the fourth round, 
pay him a million dollars. And that veterans kind of that's kind of left out. So it's a tough landscape for the middle class guys, because you're right. When these guys are making big money at the top, there's not a lot of room in the middle. And this is a hard salary cap. You can you can wiggle around it, but there is a cap. Uh, and that's what teams have to work work towards. And are there any teams that are zagging here and saying, you know, everyone's going top heavy and bottom heavy. We're going to like find this nice little middle ground to, uh, you know, make our magic happen. I think the middle, the middle ground teams right now are the teams without the big quarterback that aren't paying the top quarterback. And so you're going to find like the, the Washington commanders, new GM, new head coach, rookie quarterback. They're going to have a lot of mid-level guys. They're not going to have a lot of the high level guys right now because, it doesn't make sense to go pay a guy, you know, top of the market at a position when the team's, you know, uh, not going to be there for maybe a year or two. So you're going to have teams like that that are going to kind of plateau out at middle class. But these high end teams, look at the Niners, the, the, the players they have in that team with Trent Williams and Debo and Kittle and Warner and McCaffrey. You're not going to have a lot of middle class guys in that team. So it depends on the team. If you have a quarterback, it's hard to pay the middle class. Any other big evolutions that you've seen in NFL contracts beyond, you know, increasing guaranteed money for the stars, this top heavy trend, anything else? Now is that you're seeing shorter contracts, which is great. Uh, the NFL notoriously has been, uh, you know, back in the day, six year contracts or a lot of five year contracts, even four year contracts. You're seeing a lot less of those and a lot more three year contracts, because, as you know, these these money, the guaranteed money normally runs out in year four if it's a five year contract or even sometimes you're three. So of agents, we want to get guys back to the table as soon as possible. So don't have them linger on a longer contract, do shorter contracts. The trend is getting down to usually, you know, at the at the most four year deal uh, or even three year deal. So that way, if a team, if a guy's doing really, really well, we want to get back to the table, get him paid again. Cause like I said, this is a brutal sport. These guys need to get paid. They deserve to get paid. And to have a guy linger on in a longer contract with no guaranteed money left. That's why you see guys like Trent Williams holding out. Okay. This year, no guaranteed money. He held out. Uh, Hassan Reddick's holding out right now over the Jets. So a lot of guys are holding out or not getting their just due because the contracts are too long. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't put the contract length piece of that together. And yeah, I was just found myself comparing the Dak Prescott deal, you know, four years, 240 million to Patrick Mahomes, which I forget the exact numbers right now, but it's basically the rest of his career for, you know, 400 million or whatever, however how many hundreds of millions he's getting. Um, and, but yeah, do you think those trends are going together of the more guaranteed money, but also shorter deals? Is, is there a reason why we're seeing these at the same time? Yeah, because I mean, you look at the salary cap, it, it, it exploded in terms of the revenues with the TV contracts. So the TV contracts went up, the salary cap went up, and these teams are like, look, man, if we want to compete, and we want to win, then we got to, you know, as agents, we got to come together and demand more guaranteed money, demand less value in the contracts in terms of years. Uh, and it's been working. These teams now are, are, are doing deals earlier. They're doing deals that are less in terms of length and more guaranteed money. So I think the agent community has done a good job as far as pushing teams and every player that wins and gets a, a less contract in terms of years, more guaranteed money, more annual uh, uh, per money per year, then we all win as a community because ultimately we got to sit there and say, what's the market? This guy got this. We want to get this as well too. So it's been working so far and it's been a good situation the last couple of years. Um, you mentioned Hassan Reddick, Trent Williams, you know, we've had a number of high profile holdouts this year, when does it make sense for a player to hold out? It, it makes sense if you feel like you're justifiably in, in uh, getting the, the wrong, the short end of the stick. I think as an agent, you have to sit there and size it up and say, okay, what are we trying to achieve? Can we achieve it? Every team's different because, you know, some teams, if you hold out on and, and, and you do that, you might not get what you're looking for. And in the case of Hassan Reddick, he's losing a lot of money. Now, he might not make this money ever back. Um, you know, one of my, you know, my podcast partners and my longtime client, Marshawn Lynch, said he'll never give his money away. And so as a player, you got to really, if you're holding out, you got to really know if you're going to, you're going to achieve the goal of getting what you want to get. Otherwise, you're just going to lose money. The system now doesn't, doesn't warrant holdouts. So in Hassan Reddick's case, he's getting fined every game now, 800,000 per game. Uh, he got fined in training camp, in preseason games. And so you're never going to make that money back is the problem. 
Okay. But as a player, you got to sit there and say, if I'm going to hold out, you got to have conviction. You got to be prepared to lose money. But as an agent, you also got to sit there and size it up and say, is this hold up worth it? And sit down with the client, almost whiteboard the hold out and say, okay, if we do this, we might not get this. Is that okay with you? Or what's the, what's the landscape? So you really got to have all the information. You got to have all the knowledge. You got to be playing two steps out of the team to figure out what we're trying to get and why. And if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, then you got to sit there and say, okay, what's, what's plan B? I have to ask you about your podcast. You already mentioned one of your co-hosts, Marshawn Lynch. Uh, the other one is Gavin Newsom, our governor. Uh, we're both in California. How did this come to be? So Gavin's my longest uh, friend. I've known him since college. Uh, right out of college, we became uh, good friends. And um, we uh, and, and Marshawn's been my longtime client since 2006 when he came out of Cal. So Gavin and Marshawn knew each other very well uh, from when I represented Marshawn early in his career. And we've all, you know, and Marshawn and Gavin have had a great relationship. So Gavin called me one night about a year ago and said, hey, man, we should do, we should do a podcast. I said, what do you mean we should do a who? And he said, me, you and Marshawn. And uh, so it started as kind of a late night phone call to figuring out, can we do it? Because uh, there's never been a sitting governor to do a podcast. And so he decided um, uh, he was able to do it. And, um, and we got together with Marshawn and Marshawn loved it. And so our, our thought process was, let's start one. And Marshawn came up with politic. And because like, he came where he came from, you politic all day long, whether it be about, you know, uh, business, sports, uh, any, anything out there in life. Uh, let's call it politicking with no politics. And we decided to have, you know, guests on for the right reasons, not just talking about a movie premiere or a book deal, but let's bring people on. That makes sense. We've gone to San Quentin and done episodes with uh, inmates that were on death row. Uh, we, we got a gr lot of great stuff planned. So yeah, it's called politicking uh, on iHeartRadio and all the different podcast uh, channels and whatnot. So it's been a lot of fun. And with Marshawn is very unique uh, with the governor is very unique. So I would say I'm kind of the Ernie Johnson and I got Shaq to my left and I got Charles Bark to my right. And so it's been a, it's been a fun ride. So this is all stuff that you'd say is generally, you know, it's, it's mapped out with the agent. You know, I mean, it makes sense. It's a big, it's a negotiating ploy. So of course you'd think the agent would be involved. It just, in the media, I feel like these are often portrayed as like this kind of almost a lone wolf situation where like this guy is, you know, separating himself from the team and just, you know, doing off, doing his own thing. Um, but but it's a strategy, right? It's 100% a strategy. You got to sit there. I mean, look, it comes down to number one, you know, having m m many, many dialogues with the team about what's going on. Uh, I'm sure before Hassan Reddick decided he's not coming in or didn't want to report, there was conversations that were had that weren't to their likings, him and his agent. They figured out a plan, a strategy. And right now, you know, it hasn't worked with the team. Um, why? I don't know. Um, Hassan may have great reasons to hold out and, and not come in. I think he's got one year left on his contract, but, you know, he's got a great agent. Uh, they do great work. And so that comes down to, you know, what is the, what's the end game? And, and that's up, ultimately up to the player to decide. An agent can give all the players advice and counsel. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're our boss and they're going to dictate, no, I'm not coming in or yes, I'm coming in. And we got to give them all the information we can, all the stuff out there, put it on the table, put the chips in, and then they got to decide what they want to do. Holding out seems to me like mostly an NFL phenomenon. You you can correct me if I'm wrong there. I, obviously, NBA players do it every once in a while, but I almost never hear of a baseball player saying, I'm under contract, but I'm not showing up until I get a, a better contract. Um, would you say that's accurate? And also, like, why is that? Well, primarily because it's guaranteed money. When you look at baseball and basketball, these, all, these guys all have guaranteed money. Most NFL players are holding out because the guaranteed money's run out. There's no guaranteed money left. One play, one injury could could change the outcome of that guy's career if there's no guaranteed money left. Very few times you see players holding out who have guaranteed money. Okay, most some of sometimes you do, but most times as players, the guarantees have run out. Maybe there's a couple years left in the contract. They've outplayed the contract and whatnot. But baseball and basketball, those contracts are fully guaranteed. So what are you really holding out for? Because ultimately in basketball, you can't change the system if you're under max contract you maxed out. If you're not, so there's rules in the MDA too, as far as holding out and things like that. But in football, it's really, you got to get what you can get when you can get it. So if you've outplayed the contract and there's no guaranteed money left, then you got to, you got to sit there and strike when Aaron's hot and try to get a new deal and force their hand to get to redone. And hopefully the owners realize now that they want to win. 
And so now they're definitely being more apt to reward players than they have in the past. Usually sometimes if you had a five-year contract, you played two years or three years, they would never give you a new deal. Now these owners want to win. They're competitive. The values of these franchises have gone through the roof and they need their best players to win. And that's why they're owners. You got to win now in the NFL. And so you can't win if your best players aren't in the building. So the NFL is bringing in more and more revenue pretty much every year. It's this like cultural juggernaut, unlike almost anything else in America. Um, is that affect your end of things? Um, I mean, obviously it affects it in a, in a quantitative, in a qua yeah, quantitative way. There's the caps getting bigger, more money under the cap, more money to go around. Is there, are there other effects, you know, on your end beyond that? Well, I think on the football side, you hit it on the head. It's, it's the, it's the, the monetary value of the contracts have gone up. I mean, you look at it. I mean, look, when Dak Prescott signed his deal, I think four years ago, five years ago, he was the highest paid quarterback at 40 million. Uh, five years later, he's at 60 million. That just shows where the money's gone, not only his position, but every position. So in terms of that is going up, but I think broad scale at the NFL, I mean, look, nobody really in America cares about the, the backup uh, shortstop for the Colorado Rockies or the second baseman. Football, people, the, the ratings are through the roof. Every game leads the, uh, the ratings in, on every night of the week in terms of what Monday, Thursday, Friday football last week in, in, in Brazil and on Sundays. And so you're also seeing now a bigger, you know, uh, everything off the field, more marketing dollars flowing to the players, more sponsorship opportunities. Uh, more post-career opportunities. There's a lot of things that are going with these players that weren't in the past, and that's a direct result of the massive ecosystem of the NFL. Do players want different things from their agency than they did five, 10 years ago? 100%. I mean, when I started, it was like, you know, we pretty much did a contract. You may have gotten a guy, uh, a, a car deal, a, a signing, whatever it may be. Now there's so much more that goes into it with social media, higher-end marketing, more post-career opportunities, uh, brand building, uh, ownership in different uh, you know franchises, ownership in teams. There's so many different things going on now that's available for players that weren't available when I started you know 30 years ago, and even 10 years ago it wasn't as available as now. So players have brands; they need to build their brands. Whether you're the the 53rd guy on the team or the or the top player in the team, there's stuff out there for all these guys, and they got to maximize their career because. Look, it's it's three to 10, 12 years, 13, 14 years for the top end guys. And so if you can maximize what you're doing, also look for post career. So when you're going into this next phase, you're jumping into something you want to get into, whether it be real estate, whether it be finance, whether it be coaching. So ultimately, as an agency, you want to really help these guys not only for their career, but also as they're getting done, what's the next phase you want to get into? Use your celebrity, use your persona from the NFL player uh, to jump in the next great thing when you're done playing. Uh, obviously, you know, we think of agents as negotiating between players and teams, but it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is separate from the team. It's uh, you know, just a yeah, player building out his brand, finding investments and, um, and yeah, becoming, you know, someone who can have a lucrative career, you know, from ages 35 onward. Yeah. Like, like Cam Jordan, who's going to be a hall of fame defensive end, one of my longtime clients, he's been with me for 13 years. I've done four contracts in 13 years. But that, those are four deals in 13 years. So there's a lot of things that go on in that time frame for him that we've done, whether it be broadcast work, marketing, uh, social media, philanthropy, life after football, uh, networking, all the things that go into it we're involved with, and not just for him, but all the players. And so, yes, you have the, our job as, a, as an agent, okay? We call, they call us contract advisors. That's what we are. But... It's not just that. That's a small part of it. And the big picture also is everything else that goes with it as well. Although, you know, that is probably the biggest part. You got to get, make sure the contracts are done right, dot the I's, cross the T's, get them paid and understand that landscape. But outside of that, there's a lot of things we do as agencies and agents that provide value every single day. Doug Hendrickson, thanks so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. The Professional Women's Hockey League has named its teams and unveiled team logos. My colleague Margaret Fleming joins the show to discuss the naming process, what that says about the league, and which ones we like. Joined now by front office sports breaking news reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Hi, Owen. 
Hey, great to have you on. So the PWHL is giving their team's names for its second season. Uh, the process here is kind of interesting. How were these names picked? To just back up last year, the first year of the PWHL, it was just PWHL Boston, PWHL Minnesota. You know, for the six teams, it was just PWHL and where they were. Um, and now they all have names, which is really exciting. So um, they spoke to fans and they spoke to like GMs and um, and kind of got input there at the beginning. But really the final process um, came down to, you know, where they could get the IP, you know, in Canada and the U.S. Um, for which names. And then the small group of people, they took it to like the advisory board. That includes like Billie Jean King. Um, then, yeah, they took it to those people and then said, hey, teams, here are your names. And the teams were like, great, these are our names. So our players, the same kind of thing. So it was, it's kind of an interesting thing compared to what we're seeing in other new kind of team name rollouts. Um, but we haven't even mentioned them yet. I'm sure people are on the edge of their seats if they don't know. I'm, I apologize, but it's the Boston Fleet, Minnesota Frost, uh, Victoire de Montreal. So that one is intentionally French and does not have an English counterpart counterpart excuse me uh new york sirens ottawa charge and toronto scepters um a lot of thought went into all of those and all the logos and everything but yeah but yeah i mean it just speaks to kind of the centralized nature of the league right now it's just six teams yeah they're all it's all kind of collectively owned and leagues in their early stages tend to be more centralized and you know as teams kind of grow and get their own revenues and get more established yeah you know, sometimes they become more independent entities like Major League Baseball can't really boss around the Yankees and say, like, now you're named the something else's. Um, but um, but the PWHL is, you know, it's it's all kind of one thing right now. Yeah, exactly. It's super interesting. I mean, a big part of why the PWH, PWHL even happened is because, you know, players came together and said, we have a vision for this new league and this is what we want it to look like. And it's been uh, kind of different in that way from if you think like, you know, the the w or something like that where it's um it's like they're kind of gaining more resources and more professionalism over time like from the start this is what players wanted and so it's always had this very like across the board this is what we all have um nature to it it's yeah so that's this is kind of part of it is that like you know as a league we're gonna announce our our names as a league we're gonna all like be in charge of that process um and put like equal amounts of thought into all of them so it's really interesting now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about the names themselves. Uh, what do you like? What do you what do you think's a little silly here? <laughs> they definitely they definitely went with a lot of those um, those kind of like uh, collective nouns um, that we see a lot of times in women's sports, like fleet and frost. Um, yeah, there's only two at, that end in s: the sirens yeah. and the scepters. I think sirens is really interesting because just like New York and sirens and whatever. Um, they were saying on the call on the call to rep with reporters today, like how that like teal turquoise kind of matches the Liberty and the um, NYC Gotham because um, they're all kind of doing that Statue of Liberty green, which is which is cool that they all kind of match. It's sort of like um, unplanned planned, which is pretty cool. Um, I think some of the funniest discourse has been um, for the Ottawa Charge and the Toronto Scepters that both of those logos kind of look like other logos people are kind of making fun of it online like the Charge looks like a mix between the Cleveland Cavs C and the Calgary Flames C um, and then the Scepters looks kind of like a old Taylor Swift music video with the TS um, <laughs> she wore like a blue and yellow um, I think she was like a cheerleader in the video and that was her that was her um, high school logo um, to say so anyway um I like I like them I think I don't know if I I think Minnesota Frost is cool I like that Montreal is in French and I like Boston so those are probably my favorite but I don't I don't know we, it's early it's early give me a couple days and I'll better my my main takes here are they're actually based on the logos as well as the names so mm -hmm. first of all Boston Fleet I was like okay you know Boston's you know coastal support city Sure, but the logo is kind of cool. It's basically the Hartford Whalers logo turned on its side, but made pointier. So it's kind of a cool, I think, homage to a previous uh, hockey team, not right in that area, but close enough. Um, and the New York Sirens, when I saw that name, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like New York, like you hear sirens everywhere you go. But also this is, I think, an allusion to like the sirens of the Odyssey that, you know, sang to Ulysses and, you know, he had to, you know, tie himself to the mast to not jump into the ocean. 
the logo very much goes toward the ambulance sirens end of it. So I think it would have been cooler if they looked like sirens and maybe, I don't know, their hair kind of shows yeah. like sound waves or something. I don't know. But I, I think there was potential there that was left and is kind of they're kind of leaning into like a part of New York that's very distinctive, but is also like why people want to get out of the city. A lot of the time. Yeah, well, I would think if it was sirens, it would be a little bit more like sirens New York wise. I would think it'd be more like police light colors. Like we get some like royal blue and some red. But like, yeah, I, I thought the Odyssey, too, when I thought about the sirens of like the singing the sirens but it's also like they were talking about like potential mascots a little bit on with the with the reporters and the player for um the captain for montreal was like thinking about oh maybe something with the wings because we have wings on our logo um but i feel like with the with the valkyries we're leaning into this like mythical thing and then with i feel like like angel city we've had some angel going on and so i feel like that's maybe that's the way we're trending right now which is which is cool i feel like it's like a cool embrace of like uh i don't even yeah know, no like, i'm all about the like the mythical quality. team names thing and <laughs> we support i think the sirens names. like went right up to that and was like but actually we're just named after like ambulance noises so anyway <laughs> that's my take, that's your take. Um, i'll leave it there <laughs> margaret fleming thanks so much for joining us on the show yeah anytime anytime <laughs> Netflix continues to lean into its sports documentary series, and the newest announcement won't follow a group of players, but one superstar instead, and a vocal one at that. Aaron Rodgers has always been in the national spotlight, but especially so since he began making weekly appearances on the Pat McAfee show back in 2020. On what is now ESPN's flagship afternoon show, Rodgers has spoken about his trade request from the Packers, the infamous darkness retreat in which he stayed in a pitch black room for four days, and his vaccine status, sorry, immunization status. Rodgers has embraced his superstardom as the new face of New York football, sorry Tommy DeVito, and there's no better evidence than agreeing to this new series, which will be aptly titled Enigma. The series will follow Rodgers' comeback on the field, which began last night against the 49ers, the QB's hometown team. It is set to air on December 16th, so get some popcorn and your favorite ayahuasca ready this holiday season for the dramatic experience of an eccentric, legendary NFL superstar. Speaking of eccentric superstars, Shaquille O'Neal is one of the first to develop his own candy line, and now you can eat his entire head in one bite. At least that's how his newest product is being marketed. Shaq and Hershey's brand have teamed up to launch Shaqalicious XL Gummies, which are exactly what they sound like, giant gummies with the NBA star's face on them. Shaq has been a longtime candy lover and always referred to himself as the biggest kid in the candy store, so it makes sense that his gummies would follow suit. You might say that Hershey sees Shaq as a golden ticket in the candy industry. Hershey said that it was thrilled to partner with Shaq, a candy lover and cultural icon, to bring more fun to our gummy products. And while we all think of Hershey's having the chocolate scene locked down, they said that the gummy market is booming, growing nearly twice as fast as chocolate, offering us a dynamic space for innovation and creativity. Who knew? So along with tech mogul, sneaker brand executive, and DJ, we can go ahead and check Willy Wonka off the list of hats that Shaq has worn in his post-playing career. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend and send us your thoughts about anything we've covered by sending an email to today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.